don't know. <laughs> Let's talk about the wig maker. Um, mm -hmm. We got um, we got Janet's story the other day, and uh, maybe you could tell your side of how the chat became a book. Um, well, Janet has has spoken about, and she writes in her introduction about uh, how this how the the kind of seeds of this project began um, when there's a fire uh, over just over the way. And that fire, by the way, was um, was arson. Some guys down at the lake were started a fire um, in the woods just below the road. Um, and it's a very steep incline full of tr dry trees and a bunch of houses and, and uh, a kind of park. And um, it was a very windy day, hot and windy. And when they started the fire, it, it went in the direction of the wind, which was Northeast. So in fact, the fire was moving away from us as it continued. The only thing that we had to be afraid of was if the wind changed direction, then we would have been in trouble. But, um, but there were people who lived way closer to the fire than us who were not evacuated. Um, so I guess they rely on the, the weather guys and whatnot to be able to figure out the wind. And uh, in that case, also uh, uh, the sort of park, the area where the fire occurred wasn't that far from the local Lake Country Fire Department. So they were able to race over there and start dealing with it. And then all the, the air um, support came and the fire retardant dropping and so on. But it was still frightening. Um, and um, and Janet was was at home alone at that time, and and uh, so we invited her over, and we all sat around on the deck and talked, and and uh, ate and drank and reminisced, and so that's how that's that's where I think Janet Janet and I had been neighbors up to that point, but we kind of became friends that night. And uh, she and I um, uh, felt a bond. Um, and uh, so then in, as we met again, other days and other weeks after that, uh, this idea of, of her story, of me being involved in some way in getting her story into print um, began. And at first I, I suggested that she write it herself. And I said, just um, write it. If you want to write it, you write it and bring it over and I'll, I'll look at it. And, uh, but she kept saying she couldn't write. And I said, well, you sure can't talk. So, so, and she's so articulate and smart and, and she's great to listen to. So I said, well, uh, just okay so for starters I said you come over because I was aware right from the beginning that I didn't want to do some as told to kind of book with Janet and that I I don't know how conscious it was but there was a reluctance on my part I thought I'm not going to write somebody else's story right so how so what's going to happen here so um, anyway so the first time she came over and she talked and because uh, I'm a really fast typist, this is from my work experience as a young woman, as a stenographer and dictaphone, um, you know, typist uh, when I was younger. Um, so, I, so I can listen and type at the same time. So I just did that. And uh, so she was talking and I, I said, so I, printed it up and I said, look, here, here's you talking now, just go and keep doing that, but yourself. And she really didn't want to. And by then I was thinking, I kind of like this. This is kind of working because she can talk and, and I have all the 
you know, she doesn't need to worry about writing, you know, how you worry about writing and if it's good enough and especially when you're not a writer, right? And uh, so that's how it started. And then it just snowballed from there um, in the sense that, uh, you know, Janet would come over. We never had an agenda. She would come over and talk and I would type what she was saying. And I sent you, Paul, that um, one of the pages of the transcript. So there's a lot, I'll show you here. This, this is the transcript. And at certain points, I would um, email the transcripts that she'd written so far to Janet, just so she had a, a record of what, what she had said and what I'd heard, because I wanted it to be accurate. And at a couple of points, she helped me out. I asked her to write a timeline of all that she knew about her family, who was related to who, because at the beginning, it's like aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so and all these people I didn't know. So that helped me. And then she also wrote some little kind of character sketches of, of Penny and a few other people, her dad and so on, her mom. And um, I still have those. So, and I did use some of that material for the book as well, or for the text of the, the long poem. But it wasn't until a couple of, a year, at least a year and a half, maybe two, where I'm thinking, well, how am I gonna write this? I just didn't know. I was not gonna write it in third person. Um, I was not gonna do an as told to. So what was I gonna do? And I kept thinking poetry, it's gotta be poetry somehow. Why? Because I think, because my ear was telling me that from, and, and when I looked at like, for example, in this transcript, you can see it isn't just straight one big paragraph, one sentence after another, that there's a rhythm here in these lines. And um, so I'm thinking all this time about what, how to do this and what I'm going to do. So Paul, if you don't mind, I've got a couple of things here that I'd like to just sort of show you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so one of the things I was looking at was, you know, Charles Reznikoff? Sure. And his walking, you know, he's one of the objectivists. He walked all around New York and wrote poems about his walking. He has a poem about the Holocaust as well. Yes. And that's, this is, um, he uh, scoured court documents and wrote these, these uh, poems verbatim from court documents, from people's testimony. The book is called Testimony and it's Holocaust victims. It's um, this one is called Slave Sale New Orleans. And it's a, um, a description from court documents of, of a slave sale. So I'm looking at that and, um, but what, what I do, what the thing, the challenge posed by Janet's work is that she didn't just sit there and tell a story the way you would in court or something. Like it was all over the place. Um, and it was emotional and there were times, you know, that we're both crying and, and I'm typing and, uh, you know, so it didn't have that kind of clarity that a court doc document would necessarily have because the court, you know, so that didn't, I wasn't able to do it this way. Uh, however, one of two of my favorite writers are uh, poets are, um, and they both write long poems, um, William Carlos Williams and Ed, Ed, Edward, Ed Sanders, you know, Ed Sanders and William Carlos Williams, of course. So I was thinking, how am I going to do this? And, and I kept, all I could think of was variable foot. 
um, which is William Carlos Williams' triadic line, step down line. Indented, and, tri indented triadic stanzas. Yes. And he, but his theory about that was that these were uh, breath lines. And I've, I've never been able to kind of figure out the breath line because what do you take a breath and then I, I don't know what he means by that, but, but there's something to do with the body with, with some kind of inherent or um, bodily sense of your own rhythm going into, into those lines. So here's to a dog injured in the street. Look at this, okay, variable foot. And same with his great poem, The Desert Music. So there's that. Then there's my buddy, Ed Sanders, who wrote, um, I was looking for it downstairs, I couldn't find it. Uh, he wrote a verse biography of um, Anton Chekhov and a verse biography of Allen Ginsberg and a verse biography of the year. Oh, you've got it. Great. So can I see, could you open it up? Yeah, but to the page. Yeah, exactly. So same with 1968. Let's see, and he's got the, um, oops, yeah. So these for me became models and inspirations. Um, and they were floating around in the back of my mind. Talk to us about how this concept of the moan came into the book, sort of how, how it just became a, a metaphor really for what, what that, what, what it was like being in that house. Um, and, and I mean the house of Janet Gallant when she was oh, yeah. growing up and being abused and seeing her brother or not seeing it, but being there when her brother killed herself and all the horrific things she went through. Exactly. I um, subscribe to uh, a daily newsletter from um, a, a Catholic organization in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, it's uh, run by uh, Father Richard, Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R. Um, and, um, so he, so I get this every day and I've done courses with him on, uh, Franciscan spirituality. And, uh, so one day across the transom comes this, uh, uh, little talk or whatever newsletter from Richard Rohr in, in which he talked about he was talking about uh, the slave ships and um, talking about the moan, the moan on the slave ships and how the moan was a way of communally experiencing that horror. And um, so I kept all these and I thought, oh, this sounds, you know, so I, I, um, print them up the ones that I really like and keep them a little folder. And so one day when Janet was talking, I think she said something about the uh, Billy's moaning or something. And I twigged on the Richard Rohr newsletter and Janet is always kind of, <laughs> it's, she, she noticed I'm, I'm self-conscious about it now, but I'm always, so I'm sitting here, Janet's here and there's my bookshelf. So I'm always going, oh, hold on. <laughs> I go over here and I get a book and bring it out. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, so I brought out the Richard Rohr thing and that, that became in a way the, the, the er sound of this manuscript. It became, that was what we found together. That was what it was going to be, the moan. And um, so, yeah, so that that really kind of became a kind of magnet for a lot of the apparent kind of loose ends of this. In the meantime, I'm talking to Rolf on uh, at New Star, 
Rolf Moore. Yeah. And uh, I said, Rolf, do you think you might be interested if I could come up with something with this book? And he said he was. And uh, just to keep in touch. And so I phoned him. I would phone him occasionally to let him know what was going on. But then at one point, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, uh, Janet and I were sitting here and I, I just, it just came out. I said, Janet, I've got to write it as a poem and it's going to be called The Wig Maker. And we both just about started crying at that point. And she said, did you know The Wig Maker was my, you know, was like her, she couldn't have imagined anything better than than that title and uh so that was that was a really really beautiful moment and another one was when <clears throat> the box of books arrived on her porch and on my porch and we texted each other and i couldn't help it i just ran over she opened the door she knew it would be me and we just hugged and cried and hugged and cried. It was so marvelous. Yeah. One of the other sources is uh, Svetlana Alexievich. Yes. Very central. And this uh, is her book. An Oral History of Women in World War II. And um, this book was recommended to me by a dear friend and co-poet, uh, two of them here in Kelowna, um, John Lent and uh, John Lent and uh, Jake Kennedy. I get Jake's name mixed up with Ray Ruzeski's all the time. Anyway, not that they're the same sort of person, but anyway. Uh, uh, have you, you know, because I, I had been telling a few people, people close to me, poet friends, about this project and I, what, what was I going to do and, you know, the basic um, situation of it. And so John said that um, he and Jake had been talking about it and had I read this book by Svetlana Alexevich and I hadn't. So I sent for it. And it was exactly, exactly what I needed. Um, and I quote uh, from her wonderful introduction a few times throughout The Wig Maker, but that really gave me the, um, uh, I, I hate to use that word support, but- Structure? Structure, not so much structure because she's, she's writing, you know, prose uh, uh -huh. uh, stories that um she recorded and this was not a sound recording so mm -hmm. um but it was her approach uh where she would go over to one of these women's houses and sit there and and then just sort of allow the person to start talking and um, she wasn't directing it in any way. Uh, she would just listen with the, I guess, with the, I, I shouldn't say they were recordings, I don't know for sure. Um, it's hard to think of what. Oh, yeah, she woman. says, I think that today I would probably ask different questions and hear different answers and would write a different book. Uh, the documents are living witnesses. They don't harden like cooled clay. They don't grow mute. They move together with us. What would I ask more about now? What would I like to add? Um, so, but these are uh, really, really heartrending, amazing stories. I, I couldn't even, I, I haven't even finished reading the book. It's too painful at times. It, it's just, uh, yeah. But very, very central to the composition of this book. Um, and I'm just looking over here. Oh, another thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, you, you, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in too much. No, tell me what you were gonna what you were gonna grab. I was gonna show you another book that was central to 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 the this to the composition of this one, 
which was very problematic as to how the uncanny, the alchemical, the mystical, um, the Gothic quality of this um, of this book or uh, the, the, or of the composition of this book, the, the whole process of it was going to be included because I couldn't, uh, because of course, as uh, Janet is telling the story, her story in the bits and pieces and so on that she did, that she was able to when she became able to, um, that, that uh, at the same time, she's trying to find her eldest brother and trying to find relatives who could talk to her and give her more information. So she's looking in, she's a very, very good researcher. She's looking into census records. She's looking into, and so then she does the ancestry test because she thinks maybe her eldest brother's looking for her. That's when she finds out that her biological father was not this monster, but this um, uh, really, <laughs> I saw a picture of him, really nice looking, <laughs> great guy who had just happened to live in the downstairs suite from their family. And when the cat's away, the mice will play, <laughs> so to speak. So to speak. So anyway, that was a huge shock, of course. Well, the, fa the fact that it happened through your collaboration, that she exactly. started, you know, there, were, there, were, there was progress in her life or developments that may or may not have happened had the wig maker and the process of making it uh, happened. That's um, exactly true. Exactly. One, one of the threads, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, I saw Jim Carrey's old bit about somebody asking him about being Canadian, you know, and he goes into something so very, very funny about being in the great white north and playing hockey and watching out for moose and all the other cliches and the way he does it with his facial expressions and, and that is, is funny. I hope I can find it and maybe link to it. But, um, you know, I'll, I will say one thing, most US Americans don't know there are any black people in Canada except maybe old Chicago Cub fans who remember Ferguson Jenkins, who won 20 games in a row uh, year after year after year as a starting pitcher for the Cubs in the 70s during those teams who, during that time when the teams got very close, like 1969, but lost to the Mets. Do you know much about the African Canadian community? I don't think they even call it that. Well, no, I knew absolutely zero. Uh, until I started this work with Janet. And uh, one of the, there, there's a lot of really astounding things that happened during the, the composition of this book, the co-composition, I, I guess I would call it. Uh, one of them is Janet just happened to be in Edmonton and walked up a street and looked across the street and there was a, a three stories high photograph of her great grandfather. I think it's her great grandfather, Frank Johnson. And the, uh, this was at the new Royal Museum of Alberta. And they had a, uh, an exhibit uh, in the museum from a community called Wildwood, uh, which was a black community settled by black people uh, in, I don't know, I forget what year, but indeed there was, it was an, uh, um, an area called Amber Valley or maybe Amber Valley was also a kind of town or settlement. There was Wildwood, which used to be called Junkins. And then I think there were a few other communities in Northern Saskatchewan. So that Northern Alberta, Northern Saskatchewan, and the prime minister at the, at the time had offered 160 acres if you 
you know, wanted to dig out the Muskegon swamp and logs and build homesteads and stuff. And, and these people did. Uh, they were originally, at least Janet's family, originally from uh, Texas and then Oklahoma. And um, there was, I think, quite a few people from the same family or something who were living in, in Oklahoma. Anyway, they were kind of a large uh, group who came up to Canada um, to settle in Northern Alberta. And no, I didn't, I had no idea. And I did go to this same exhibit uh, when I was visiting a friend in, um, in Edmonton and uh, it was fascinating to see uh, the um, cane and the hat of Janet's direct <coughs> relation, um, to see the sign that advertised her Auntie May's pies uh, there was a pie shop. There was a little kind of a black enclave within El within Edmonton itself, where there was the church and some restaurants and and a little community there. But no, I had I had no idea either. And uh, I think it was 160 acres and four mules. Something I, I, like I'm that. Not, I'm not sure if I if I got yeah. that. Be beats 40 acres and a mule. Um, how important is it to you? that there be an intensity of feeling in a book. I mean, it was unavoidable for this one, but isn't that what we come to poetry for? Not just to have a happy time and to feel good, but just have an intense feeling of being alive by having this experience. You know, my, my partner is like, maybe you should stop reading this book. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. I, you, I, I read it, I you know blew my nose several times and, and then I called you up or emailed you and said, I'm ready to do the interview. So, I mean, we don't get this. We don't get this from poetry as much as we should, don't you think? Yeah, I, I agree. And I didn't, I didn't write it with that in, in mind. Um, I mean, you couldn't help it, but, no. but not write anything like that. I mean, you could have yeah. sanitized it, but no, I wouldn't have had the power. No, no, it, it was... I think there was a really, uh, there was a, a, a spirit, a Holy Spirit directing this. Um, and I think it's, it's true. I, somebody said to me uh, in relation to the book that it reminded them of what poetry was for and something that this person had lost sight of, but was re restored to a sense of when reading this book this is what poetry is for you you say um in the afterward that this story is what has begun to show janet's true identity why don't you elaborate on that uh well it's hard to say what anyone's true identity is but i mean only in the sense i suppose of in, on the one hand um the results of the dna test who her biological father actually is, but also in a larger sense that one's true identity is larger than one's mere identity, that her true identity is as an ar articulate beloved person in this world who has given um, great hope uh, to others who are who might need it, who are reading this book, who has opened our hearts to the, the pain of persons um, trying to walk around on this planet and, uh, and has, um, I think, uh, brought um, a, a deep wealth of complex emotion to a subject, i.e. child abuse or whatever, that is far too often simply made fundamentalist uh, and, and simplistic. And, um, and it's, I think what she has done in opening up to me is to create, uh, to create a um, kind of matrix of understanding and hope that otherwise 
isn't around. I think we're going to have to close with that. I think that's a good way to close. I had other questions planned, but I'll ask you the next time we talk about those questions. But before we go, can I just put in a word for the great support uh, that Rolf Moore at New Star gave to me and to Janet. Uh, he spoke to Janet. He coached her through her introduction. He took on this project, which I was turned down for two major grants um, that was going to get, you know, possibly attacked for cultural appropriation or something. But he he stuck by us, and um, and I think uh, he he is really owed a great debt of gratitude. That my closing line was: the wig maker is published by New Star Books of Vancouver, BC. That was how Thank I was going to end it. And, uh, um, you know, of course, it says a lot about this woman who went through all this stuff and has come through and has told her story and has taken that abuse and has done her best to make sure that it stops now in her bloodline. And that is all we can hope to do in a lifetime. And that's beautiful. But you also uh, extracted the poetry from it. You sent me that one page of your notes and I looked at it and I'm like, I don't want to read it because the book is the essence of that, you know? So um, it was nice to see it, but it was, un it was other than just give me an idea, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. And so, I mean, it says a lot about you as a human being that A, she would trust you, that, uh, that B, you would do it with, with a reverent way, that you would extract the poetry out of it. And, you know, you'd worry about people saying you were doing cultural appropriation, but which is one of the questions I asked Janet uh, two days ago. I know, I oh, loved her answer. Oh, and yeah, it was beautiful. Four Sister, letter words. <laughs> sisterhood, sisterhood, yeah. Yeah. Well, Sharon, thanks. A thousand thanks for all you do. And uh, for me, finally getting a chance to interview. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. <laughs>